Well, hello and good evening and welcome to everyone joining. We'll just wait uh, a minute or two for everyone to connect in, but it's great to see you all. Um, and I already recognize a couple of familiar names. So thank you for joining us again. Um, and also I suspect you're tuning in from all around the world, which is great. Um, just while I uh, wait for you all to connect through and um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, just a the, the usual reminder, I know I say it every time, but you know, we put on these lectures uh, for free um, and you know, we're not going to be charging for them. But of course, if you're not a member of the Society for Church Archaeology, please do consider joining us to support us because it's you know, only through that membership support we can continue to bring you exciting, thrilling and scintillating speakers like tonight. Um, and of course, there are lots of other benefits to joining the Society as well. So do have a look at our web page if you're not a member. Um, I think because we, we, we connected in just a little bit late, um, I will not blather on any more for the moment, uh, but I will introduce our speaker, um, who may well be known to, to some of you. Um, tonight we have Dr. Michael Shaplin, um, who is a senior historic buildings um, archaeologist for Archaeology Southeast. Um, and well, he's, the reason I slightly hesitate is um, Michael is a man of many talents and I know him in, in other guises as well. So, but that, that, that's his current uh, position. Um, but he's well known for specializing in the archeology span of Anglo-Saxon churches amongst other things. Um, and I was about to say recently, but it's actually about four, four or five years ago, you published a book on Anglo-Saxon uh, towers of lordship. Uh, but uh, which is a, a standard work on student reading lists. Uh, but tonight he's not going to be talking about tower. Or maybe he's going to be talking about towers. I don't know. But he's going to be one, telling us one a, tower, one tower, one, one tower, one tower you're, only. You're, you're not going to disappoint. We get it. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, he's going to be talking about Selsey Cathedral and the early medieval kingdoms of Sussex. So I will hand over to Michael without any ado. <clears throat> Just with a slight reminder, of course, which I forgot that if you have questions during the talk, do just pop them into the chat box and we'll we'll pop them to Michael at the end. Anyway, Michael, please take it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Hugh. Let me just share my screen and then um, let me get underway. Good. So I hope everyone can see this and hear me, but do let Hugh know if that is not the case. Um, so I'm going to ramble on for a bit um, about Selsey Cathedral, because um, I, I recently became, well, a couple of years ago, became the archaeologist for Chichester Cathedral in Sussex. Um, Chichester Cathedral being this and being established um, where it is in about 1075. Hugh, just a quick question. The the top of my screen is obscured by a sort of Zoom clutter. I I hope everyone can see the top. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's all right. Oh, good. OK, good. Um, uh, so, yes, Chichester Cathedral founded 1075 uh, and remains the cathedral for Sussex. Uh, but one of the things that struck me when I was um, sort of looking at this site and getting my head around it was the predecessor of Chichester Cathedral, which was about seven miles to the south in uh, Selsey Bill. Um, and it was there from about 705, potentially earlier. It was there for 400 odd years before it ended up in Chichester. Um, and it's it's a spectral place, Selsey Cathedral. It's it's a bit of a of a mysterious one because why why would they put it there in the first place and why would it stay there for four hundred years until it moved to the startlingly more obvious place of Chichester and it was that thread that I was that I was trying to follow uh, which led me to some potentially quite interesting thoughts about what's going on in Anglo-Saxon 
Sussex. So I was going to share those thoughts with you um, and see what you think. So as I say, originally, well, Cathedral now, Chichester, um, all very sensible. Originally, Selsey, uh, probably at Church Norton, on the northeastern side of what's now a peninsula, used to be an island. Um, but to modernise, this is a very sort of oddly liminal place. You know, it's it's handy for Asda supermarket, but it doesn't make much sense if you're trying to build a cathedral. Um, and when you go there now, you know, there's not really much there. In fact, you, you could you could visit it and not even know that this was the site for 400 years of a major cathedral. Probably we don't even know it was here. This is the extent to which this is a kind of a bit of a of, of an odd one. So there's there's a large modern, fairly modern cemetery. There's a um, the chancel, which is all that survives of a medieval parish church dedicated to Saint Peter, uh, which is used as a sort of um, as a funerary a funerary chapel because the church itself was dismantled in the Victorian period and moved and isn't here anymore. Um, we get a few scraps of what may have been here during the medieval period. So this is a painting from uh, the early 16th century of Selsey. Um, there's, our, there's our lost parish church. Here is a large detached tower, um, which I'll come on to in a minute. And we also have from slightly earlier, but still outside of the period when this was ever a cathedral, um, a seal which depicts a convincingly kind of Carolingian type church of the kind of status and architecture of what we might expect uh, of a cathedral in this period. But we have no way of knowing whether this is what Selsey Cathedral looked like at all. Um, and then we have these. So we have four stones. Uh, it used to be five. One of them got lost. Four pieces of fairly bog standard late Saxon interlace, uh, which apart from a handful of charters, many of them spurious, are the only things now you can see or touch which relate to the probable site of this cathedral. Um, and they, again, they're not even at the site of the cathedral anymore, that they've been moved to, and they may not even have come from the cathedral building. They sort of, they feel a bit more like they may have come from a cross. And the sheer lack of stone from what would have been a huge and important building, it starts to uh, occur to me that this building may not have been made of stone at all. Maybe it was made of timber. So that's another thing to bear in mind. Um, and there's a large, uh, it's called the mound. It's not really a mound at all. It's a sizable earthwork enclosure, which encompasses the site of that tower depicted on the painting, uh, which is, again, purpose unknown, may have been a bell tower, may have been a keep. It uh, may be that this ring work, which is quite late, dates to the period after the bishop uh, disappeared off to Chichester, and this became the residence for some other high status personage. The ring work doesn't even make sense with relating to the um, site of the parish church. So we don't really know anything about this cathedral at all, particularly. There's, there's a, a, a single belt tab of ecclesiastical type, which may be relating to this church. And underlying this site, which has been excavated in, in a fairly limited way um, on a few occasions, um, there's some Iron Age and Roman stuff, but nothing particularly diagnostic. So that's it. So if we're going to answer the question, why did they build Selsey Cathedral here? Uh, we're not going to find it at the probable site of the cathedral, which may not even have been exactly here. So. We're going to start thinking about the landscape, which is mainly what I'll be talking about this evening. So one suggestion for why this cathedral was built here, put forward by Julian Munby a few years ago, was that he identified Pagham Harbour, which is 
this as being a, a, a wick, so a Middle Saxon trading place. You know, you get the big ones, London Wick, Hamwick, Southampton, Yorvik, York, Ipswich. Um, this was a kind of, you know, second tier trading place with good evidence for lots of coinage and other traded metalwork. Um, but I don't think that answers the question. It, it's very likely that this significant church would have had aspects of royal power and authority during this 8th century period. Uh, but I don't think that explains why they put the church there. Um, so just a bit of context, many of you will be familiar with this, with this general overview of what's happening in Britain in this period. But essentially you have a large number of kingdoms, uh, not one big unified kingdom like you get by the 10th century, but you have a large number of much smaller kingdoms, many of which survive as modern day, modern day shires and counties. Um, some of which were very important and influential, Northumbria or, or Mercia, and some of which were incredibly minor. Um, and the South Saxon kingdom was, you know, kind of mid-table in, in, this, in this reckoning. And these were pagan um, Saxon, Anglian and Saxon kingdoms, pagan kings. And then again, I, I'll sort of try and gallop through this bit, but 597, the King of Kent, Ethelbert, who is at that point the most powerful, the most influential king and an over king over many of these other kingdoms, formally accepts a mission from Rome for um, St. Augustine to turn up and convert him and his kingdom to Christianity. Now, this is, wasn't a kind of um, a, a rapturous act of piety or any sort of mass conversion of the populace. This was a political act. Um, Christianity was excellent uh, for buttressing your, your power, your authority, legitimacy as king. And it was also a means, one of many, of asserting that authority over other kings and other kingdoms. And that seems to be the motor for other subservient kingdoms being obliged to accept this mission from Kent and other cathedrals and and um, and dioceses were established. And a diocese often, as with the South Saxons, broadly speaking, uh, seems to fossilize the boundary of its kingdom when the diocese was established, broadly speaking. And so this process happens through the 7th century. These Saxon kingdoms are nominally at least converted to a Roman form of Christianity. And so the sort of the, the standard version is, this is drawn from two near contemporary um, written sources, Bede and, and Stephen of Ripon. Um, Sussex is the last of the pagan Saxon kingdoms. Uh, and its king was Ethelwal, who I'll be talking about a bit more later. And what happens is in 681 is St. Wilfred, um, a very powerful, very political, very worldly Northumbrian bishop. Um, he's He oversteps the mark, as he does in many places, up where he is, and he washes up in Sussex. Uh, and he's welcomed by the King of Sussex, and he is given a grant of a large estate um, with a residence. The king's residence, probably one of many, but an important royal central place was at Selsey. And this is where Wilfred establishes a monastery. Um, and there's some confusion in the sources whether Wilfred is a bishop uh, of Sussex at that time or whether that cathedral Darcian status comes along a little bit later. And so jobs are good and Sussex is converted, you know, Christianity is triumphant. And so 
but then it gets a bit messy. Wilfred hangs around for five years converting the locals. Um, and then he gets fed up um, because he invites or, or maneuvers the king of Wessex, the exiled king of Wessex, who is not baptized, um, maybe a pagan, um, to invade Sussex from the west, killing King Ethelwald. This is the only picture of Ethelwald I found on the internet. He is not someone who has particular note in history. But um, so Wilfred manages the fall of Ethelwald. He is rewarded um, and then he disappears off to London to cause trouble somewhere else. Uh, and then two sub kings of Sussex, because um, Sussex in this period is not a single unified kingdom, a bit like Kent or um, East Anglia, it is an amalgam of several even smaller kingdoms. So probably two of the kings of Sussex, maybe East and West Sussex, drive Cadwalla out, Cadwalla reinvades, kills one of them, reasserts his authority, and then he disappears off to Rome to die in 688. Um, Wessex retains overlordship over Sussex. The cathedral is established, but the um, administration and authority of it is Winchester. So it sort of has a bit of a choppy start, but eventually by the early 8th century, you have a cathedral um, at Selsey, not at Chichester. So the obvious answer as to why they put it down there is because that's where Ethelwall gave Wilfred an estate and a residence and a royal centre to establish this place. But the practice of kingship relied upon an ideology, whether Christian or pagan, it was the legitimacy and the power of kingship was intimately related to whatever ideology um, you, you adhered to. And the decision to build the most important, the single biggest piece of infrastructure relating to that ideology, relating to Christianity, which is your cathedral, is not a decision you take lightly. Not only is it a huge billboard for whatever messages you're trying to convey about your power and authority, but it's also your dynastic, your dynastic burial place. So it's a hugely significant decision where you put the thing you don't just stick it down there randomly because you have an estate you weren't using, or even because it's handy for your kingdom's uh, potential trading port, um, although that is itself an aspect of royal power. Um, and the other very perplexing thing about this is Wilfred himself was a proponent of this Roman mission, the sort of heir of St. Augustine. And um, St. Augustine's mission was all about re-establishing the scaffolding of Roman Christianity across, across the British, well, the Saxon kingdoms of, of Britain. And this was done in explicitly Roman places, very deliberately, and it was executed using buildings constructed in the Roman manner using Roman materials put in forts and walled towns such as Canterbury, York, London, Rochester. And you would have thought Chichester would have occurred to them to use, um, as it had done in practically every other instance. So the fact it's not here when it really should have been and had Ethelwald wished it to be, and clearly, Wilfrid would have been desperate to have it here. Um, then it would have happened because he was the king. But it wasn't. It ended up here on an island um, described by Bede, um, surrounded on all sides by the sea. It's not anymore. You can, in this fairly early map, you can just about see it's, it matches Bede's description of connected to the mainland, little spit of land to the west. Um, and here's an attempt at reconstructing the shoreline in the early medieval period. This is where Church Norton is, if the cathedral is here. Um, the name itself is the island, the island of 
seals and in the earliest depiction of it, the Goth map is depicted as an island. So it's it's uh, an island off the shore of the south coast of of Britain. So just a bit more context as to what else is going on in Britain at that time. So you have all those pagan Saxon kingdoms converting to Augustinian Roman Christianity um, from the Pope in the south and the east. But in the north and the west, you have a number of other kingdoms, British kingdoms, Cornish kingdoms, Welsh, Pictish kingdoms. And again, it's a very, very mixed and confused picture, but a number of these were the successor kingdoms to, to the provinces of Roman, of Roman Britain, or at least they retained Christianity or form of Christianity from Roman times, um, which was heavily influenced and bolstered from Ireland, which converted in the early fifth century um, using a, a, a Romano British citizen, Patrick, and there was therefore a very lively and important strand of Christianity operating in the Irish Sea region during this period. So these sort of relict Christian, mainly Christian, British, Welsh, Pictish kingdoms are also available and they're doing something quite different. So um, this form of Christianity, it was sort of the hokey old name for it is, is Celtic Christianity. I'll call it insular Christianity. It seems to have an awful lot to do with Iron Age practice. Um, so there's more of a continuity there for much older forms of, of ideological belief and expression. So their churches, there seems to be a fondness for building timber churches at Glastonbury, which is one of these um, important places for insular Christianity. As soon as the Saxon um, king converts to the Roman form of Christianity, then there's a big stone basilican Roman looking structure built. But the predecessor to that, the church, um, the legend is established by St. Patrick himself, was of timber. Um, the tonsure that monks used, the, the Roman form is quite familiar to us, but the insular form of tonsure uh, resembles the cult figures, what little we know of them, of Iron Age, of Iron Age Northwestern Europe, which is very interesting. Even the way that Easter is reckoned, this was an enormous bone of contention. Um, the Roman Christianity, that was that was dictated from, from the Pope, which is the reckoning of Easter we have nowadays. Um, to insular Christians, it was much more to do with the movement of the spheres, with the solstice. Um, a means of reckoning that would have been standing stones, for example. So, and, and even the cross itself, so the, the crooks, the cross, um, the Latin doesn't apply here. This was the rood, uh, which is a tree. Um, that's where we get the term rood screen. So uh, these crosses, the perception of, of the cross itself uh, was as a tree in this uh, insular Christianity and indeed in the Anglo-Saxon strand of Christianity from Rome too. Um, and trees were of course central to pre-Christian, uh, pre-Roman Iron Age religious religious practice. This is not the subject of this talk, but it's it's useful context because another thing that they did differently in the north and the west was establish their monasteries not on Roman sites. That's not where they drew their authority from. Their authority seems to have been drawn more from these much, much older forms of cult, of cult practice. Um, their monasteries were typically established on islands on islands and promontories that uh, stuck out into water. This is an argument put forward by Martin Carper a few years ago. So in the south, in the east, you have all these classic 
cathedrals, many of which still operate as cathedrals today, many of which were established in the 7th century. Um, at the time we're talking about Celsi, it was in the north and the west. The major Christian centres were on islands and island promontories and peninsulas. Um, I'll just kind of random examples here. The photogenic ones, here's Tintagel. It's a, a Christian power centre of the kingdom of Domnonia, a British kingdom. Um, and and I haven't been there since the bridge was built, but it is a wonderful place to visit and extremely numinous. Um, Lindisfarne, this is a, this is the, the bishopric of the kingdom of Benicia, which is another British kingdom. It's an island promontory sticking out into, into the water. Or the Picts, um, who also uh, adopted forms of Christianity. Their power centres, their Christian power centres and monasteries were of this form. Um, <clears throat> again, another example, this is Coldingham in Benicia. So, and, and more famous examples, so Iona itself, perhaps the most influential um, Christian monastery in the West and the North. Um, so I think what you're looking at at Selzy is a classic example of an insular Christian monastic power centre, looking, to my mind, perfectly comfortable alongside Glastonbury, Iona, Lindisfarne, and all the rest of them. This is the sort of thing that a post-Roman British Christian kingdom would establish. So for that to be true, uh, you're going to need a few things in place. Um, you're going to need evidence for other bits of insular British or Irish Christianity happening in this part of Sussex at that time. And you're going to need some evidence for a sort of relict British kingdom and king operating in Sussex at the time that Selty is established by Wilfred. And those things have to be sufficiently powerful to have overridden any desire Wilfred had to establish his cathedral somewhere a bit more sensible. <clears throat> so just to start off with the king, with King Ethelwald. Now, it's not actually true that Wilfred baptised um, baptized King Ethelwald. Ethelwald was already Christian. Um, it's the case that Bede and these other uh, Saxon ecclesiastics, they massively underplay the importance of insular Christianity. They are firmly and enthusiastically pro the sort of southern and eastern Roman strand of Christianity. Uh, and where British and Irish and Welsh, Cornish and Pictish Christianity comes in, it is ignored or downplayed, marginalised in the written sources. Um, so Ethelwald was baptised already by the King of Mercia. He was baptised the wrong sort of Christian in, in the mind of, of, of these authors. So he was baptised under an, an Irish form of Christianity, which was still dominant in Mercia at that time. And he had a queen, and his queen was from the kingdom of, of the, the Huike, which is in the west, around Worcestershire. And this is another one of these post-Roman, coherently British kingdoms with, with a, a, a degree of Christianity in it, insular Christianity. And so when El Ethelwald comes back, he brings with him a number of churchmen. And these weren't just, you know, people to hold the candles. Um, they, they were seemingly quite, you know, important or, or knowledgeable ecclesiastical individuals. One of them becomes Abbot of Selzy, uh, which is interesting because, of course, this is the abbey founded by Wilfred, who was 
vehemently opposed to any form of insular Christian Christian practice. So the fact that Ethelwald, who is Christian, has a queen who is Christian um, and has a group of knowledgeable churchmen, you would have thought he would have had a church, basically, and not a bad shout for where his church would have been, is at Ethelwald's residence uh, at Selsey, presumably around Church Norton. Um, so Wilfred didn't convert King Ethelwald, and he probably didn't establish um, the monastery at Selsey. Uh, but I think both of those things were already in play before he even turns up in 681. And there's, there's kind of hints that the problem with Selsey is um, not only is there vanishingly little left of this cathedral, but most of this part of Sussex has washed into the sea. So um, there's kind of hints of what may have been here in the past. There's there's this Wick site, um, this this place of royal economic power. Um, there's a Barrow Cemetery, which is not there anymore, um, but it's mentioned in charters. And there's, I mean, there's been so little archaeology done here, but there's some metalwork of the sort of thing that I would anticipate finding in a burial mound. So this is potentially a place of high status, high status burial, as well as being the site of a mid-Saxon royal residence and Christian power center. Um, but you've got something else going on uh, quite nearby at somewhere called Bosom, just to the northwest um, of Selsey. And this is a rare example of Bede mentioning a, an insular Christian place. Um, he says there's an Irish monk here, so this this is a sort of Irish inflected uh, monastery, and he's there in Bosom, which is interestingly another one of these peninsulas sticking out into water. So it's a classic place for an Irish monastery to be. Um, but he's there. And there's only five or six of them, and they're all useless. Full stop. This is kind of what Bede says about Bosom, and then he moves on. Now, the, the fact he's forced to mention it at all kind of implies it was more important than that. Um, and there's some evidence that it was. So this is an argument put forward by John Blair uh, a while ago concerning a minster, so an important mid-Saxon monastic place at Stenning, just near Bramber in West Sussex. And he argues that this was established in the seventh century, potentially before, by an Irish monk called St. Cuthman. And uh, I won't sort of rehearse all of all of his arguments, but but there's aspects of the way this place was founded and the miracles surrounding this this saint, which are really Irish in their inflection. Um, and the fact that uh, St. Cuthman himself came from just next to Bosom and ended up establishing this monastery at Stenning, um, which was built out of timber as well. So it seems to be that this hokey little monastery was actually quite an important monastery at Bosom, capable of founding one, potentially many other monasteries um, across this part of the world not an unimportant place. Um, and there's some other evidence for insular Christianity operating in West Sussex at that time, uh, which has been strangely overlooked. So one of the pieces of evidence that we have for Christian places elsewhere in the north and in the west are place names, particularly Eccles place names, which comes from the Latin Ecclesia church. And these in many cases are thought to be or to have some aspect of actual or perceived continuity with 
Christian Roman, Christian Roman Britain. Um, and there's very, very few in the areas of the pagan Saxon kingdoms because their Christianity was, was of a very different sort and didn't have this, this continuity. Um, and the only one south of the Thames uh, is in Kent, uh, Eccles in Kent, where there is a Roman villa uh, with evidence for continuity of occupation after the fall of Roman authority. There's an early Saxon cemetery there as well. And this is held to be sort of one of the, the few examples of this kind of place existing within the, the realm of, of, of the pagan Saxon kingdom. But actually, there's another one pointed out by Richard Coates 40 years ago, uh, near Angering, just by Selsey, Eccleston. And if you look at Eccleston, which was here-ish, presumably here-ish, um, what Eccleston has is it has a Roman villa. Um, which was excavated about 100 years ago, or partially excavated. So the bathhouse was excavated. Now, I, I wish I could say, hey, folks, look, it's it's a Roman church. Now, the the uh, the pottery sequence stops in the third century or the fourth century AD. So unlike at Eccles in Kent, there's no continuity of occupation of this building at least um, through into the early medieval, the early medieval period. But the villa itself has not been excavated. Um, so who knows? But to find a Roman villa at an Eccles place, that's what you need to find to make it a convincing, um, convincing one. And also has an early Anglo-Saxon cemetery right here, just as in the Kentish example. Um, so you have reasonable evidence, surprisingly good evidence, considering quite how thin the evidence is uh, for um, insular Christianity alive and well in West Sussex at the time that Selsey was, was established. And just to look at the landscape of Sussex, uh, which is another strand to this argument. This, this was never really very successful as a single unified kingdom of the South Saxons. The kingdom of Hastings seems to have been separate and maintained its identity till really quite late. It was still um, a separate sort of place into the 11th century. Um, there are at least two kings of the rest of Sussex, which was divided north-south by major rivers. And each one of these land divisions was quite coherent and useful in its own right. So you had the coast and you had the coastal plain, which was good for arable, and you had the pastoral uh, resource of the South Downs. And then you had the weald, the wooded place, which was wood pasture for animals and for timber. So each of these chunks, uh, there's about four of them, has everything it needs East-West communication is really bad. I mean, it still is now. Um, it's quite good along the coast. But this, this sort of fragmented landscape seems to have prevented this kingdom ever really finding its feet. It always remained quite disjointed. Um, and in the 70s, early 80s, Martin Welch plotted the evidence for Anglo-Saxon stuff in Sussex through time, evidence for occupation, mainly cemeteries, some settlements and other stray finds. And um, he identified a kind of an early core or where he thought the earliest Saxon settlers had, had set up shop over in the east uh, around Lewis. And then as you move further west, um, through time, there's a gap. There's a gap in evidence for Saxon stuff in Sussex around the Selsey and Chichester region. So basically, this territorial chunk here, 
everything west of the Arrow. Um, there's a major Saxon settlement at Church Down and a cemetery at Apple Down. We'll talk about those in a bit. Um, but that's it. And there's been a lot of archaeology done in the last 40 years, but a, a, a good piece of research published extremely recently by um, Adam Goodfellow has borne this picture out. And other people have also said this is still basically true, that the core of Saxon occupation is in the east, it kind of moves west, and then there's a gap. There's a gap in the west, and it only kind of really kicks off in here, 7th, 8th century. So that's interesting. Um, so you have plausibly um, negative evidence for where the Saxons weren't strong for a British kingdom, potentially, in the West. Um, and another piece of research which came out again very recently was looking at this question of Anglo-Saxon migration and settlement in early medieval in early medieval Britain. And is looking at the DNA of a large number of cemeteries. And quite usefully for me, it looked at two in Sussex. So it looked at one in the east in the kind of heartland of early Saxon occupation. So in 491, King Ale, the first king of the Saxons, um, a very powerful overlord amongst the Saxon kings, uh, conquers the Roman shore forts at Pevensey kills the British kings who had power there and establishes his kingdom in this area. But the um, the cemetery that was looked at for this ancient DNA study found that actually the majority of people were of were of insular, were of of, of, um, were of uh, descent from from Britain. But the way that the burials were furnished and, and treated was very Germanic. So it seems to be like a sort of, uh, uh, they were acculturated. So the ancestry was British, but they were acculturated to be Germanic. Now, the other cemetery that was looked at was in the West. This was the one at Apple Down. And actually here, about half of the population was of North European heritage. Um, the other half were kind of, broadly speaking, from the British Isles. But this is quite different. So here, depending on your ancestry, your burial is treated very differently. There doesn't seem to be the same acculturation by the locals, for want of a better word, of the new order. They were buried differently and they had different stuff. Now, this is two cemeteries of many. So it's a horribly unrepresentative, unscientific, statistically meaningless example. But it does seem to fit this picture that in the East, people were remaining cheerfully Saxon, even if they were sort of ancestors were British. Whereas in the West, there was a sense of British identity remaining strong and distinct from the Saxon, um, the Saxon incomers. Um, and there's some other bits of evidence as well. So this is a place name, uh, Wall, which is where we get the term Wales. Uh, it doesn't mean slave, that's, that's a much later usage. It means originally in Old English, Romanized Britain. Um, and you get a few of these wild place names in Sussex, not many. Uh, they're all in the west, and two of them are clustered around this British Irish monastery at Bosom, which is interesting. So there were places of British character and identity, according to the place name evidence. Um, and then you have Ethel Wall himself. And again, I'm amazed that nobody's kind of talked about this before. So I've had this checked out by, by name experts, and, and, and it seems to be the case that Ethel Wall's name. So the Ethel part is, is quite standard, means kind of royal person. Lots of kings are called Ethel, uh, Ethel, Ethel Burton, Ethel Ridden, 
all the rest of them. But his surname is Wall, Romanized British person. So Ethel Wall's name essentially means King of the Britons, which is kind of startling given all the other things that I've been laying out. So just by way of some conclusions, there's certain things we, we do know. Wilfred didn't turn up in West Sussex in 681 and convert the kingdom to Christianity. Uh, and he probably didn't even establish first church at Selsey, um, because this is not a place he would have ever have dreamt of putting a church. This was like the opposite of the sort of place that Wilfred liked establishing cathedrals and major monasteries. Because this is a classic sort of insular Christian um, location for, for a monastic power centre, this island promontory of Selsey. And this sits in a landscape with reasonable evidence for insular Christian um, insular Christian practice, British and Irish Christianity already sort of alive and well at that time um, in a place which seems to have been exempt from evidence for Saxon occupation in, in a major way um, with, according to this very slender bit of cemetery evidence and some place of evidence, uh, a sense of its own of its own character as distinct from, from Saxon settlers, potentially, with a king who called himself British King, King of the Britons, Ethelwell. So I think maybe in following this thread of why was Selsey built where it was, I think you'll maybe start to catch a glimpse of a British kingdom operating here with its cult centre at Selsey. And then 400 years later, it washes up in Chichester. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Michael. Gosh, that was the... Oops, I've just turned my camera off again. I'll turn it on. <laughs> there we go. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, you brought in multiple strands of evidence to build a really really interesting argument there and one that I think was quite revelatory to me but particularly interesting actually concerning the sort of the insular tradition there you alluded a few times to material culture and that sort of thing I was wondering is there any are there any hints from things like you know sort of metal detecting to portable antiquity schemes of more insular forms of material culture in the landscape that kind of thing not just from burial but mm. uh, so forth that might suggest a, a, a British tradition. That's a really good point and it's not something I've looked at um, I think it would be worth hoovering up all the PAS data for Sussex and seeing whether there's sort of, you know, the kind of brooches and, and, and other bits and bobs that you would expect. Um, I mean, there's nothing in Selsey because Selsey is agonisingly bereft of any kind of <laughs> archaeological or any other sort of data. Um, but yeah, that, that would be a, a definite line of inquiry. I think that, that's, that's a good shout. Uh, no, no, I mean, it, it just struck me because mm. thinking about other parts of the country where this surviving insular tradition has been sort of discussed or, you know, potentially identified, you know, that that's one one interesting line of inquiry. So mm. I, I thought it was really interesting. But and, and the, oh, actually, I, it's not about me <laughs> chatting to you. This is to be for other people to ask questions as well. But uh, the place name evidence, but, well, particularly where I'm sat at the moment, uh, surrounded mm. by Eccles place names, uh, mm. um, is, is really interesting. And Wales as well. I'm only about uh, two and a half miles from a Wales. So um, anyway, um, Rob, do we have any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just prattle on. <laughs> uh, no, we don't have any other questions yet. But if anyone does, do put them in the box. Well, while people are putting their questions in their box, I am going to ask another question, which kind of is 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 one I suspect I know the answer to, 
Uh, mm. But I'll ask it anyway, more for the benefit of the audience, is that, is there any potential for field work? Mm. And that, that is a really good question. And that, that is something that, you know, I, I would like to do. Let me just share my screen again. So if we just bring up the plan of Selzy, uh, which is near the top, near the top, there we go. So if we bring up this, this plan, so there was limited trenching done by Fred Oldsworth uh, and Saltzman in the early to mid 20th century. And they were mainly interested in figuring out what this earthwork is. Um, no one's ever looked at the church and it would be really interesting to know whether this is actually the site of the cathedral at all. That's kind of question number one. Where is the cathedral? We don't really know it was ever here at all. Um, so that would be great. And the character of this tower, I mean, quite a nice thing to re-excavate. Um, this bit is scheduled, just the earthwork. This bit is not, but it's an active cemetery, uh, which probably would have knackered most of the archaeology in that area. This field uh, is unplowed and unscheduled, so maybe there, but then you're kind of whistling in the dark because you're not really digging where you want to be digging, which is which is here. So, yes, I hope so. That would be good. Is my answer to your question? <laughs> <laughs> and it's so often the case that you have these really interesting sites with these early histories, but and then you've got a modern or relatively modern cemetery sat on the top. I, mm. Either disturbing things or meaning you can't put a trench in, which. Um, I've certainly felt that frustration before as well, but you could um, probably put a trench in this path. I mean, you'd irritate every single person holding a funeral. Um, well, but, yeah, but no, I mean, yeah, that, that would be interesting. I mean, it was only a couple of months ago we had Gabor on talking about his his work and mm. re-excavating re down there and as well. So, I mean, you know, it is possible to to work around these things, but that, that would be interesting, I think. It really would. Yeah. I mean, if, if um, society wishes to fund a major research excavation, <laughs> so, uh, you know, let me know. Oh, no, I'm sure we'd happily fund the excavations <laughs> if loads more people join us uh, and support our activities. Yeah, everyone did that as an option. <laughs> I think I'm going to move on before I commit myself to anything here. Um, fantastic. Well, um, if, if, if we don't have any more questions, then I, I think I will leave it there before I spend all the society's money um, in ways I'm not permitted to do. But <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, thank you very much, Michael. That that was really, really interesting. Um, and lots, We do lots... have a couple of questions. Oh, do we? Can, sorry, sort of sorry, Rob. Right oh, to... No, no, that's all okay. right. That's all right. Um, okay, so let's have a look. So we've got one here, quite a... Okay, so Louise has asked a question saying, would the church, presumably on screen, not more likely be in the ring work? Would it be wooden? Mm. Well, I mean, that is a good question because we don't know where the Saxon church was. I mean, churches don't tend to move for various sort of profound reasons of, of permanence and eternity and, and all that. They, they tend to stay put. Um, they sort of they grow and shrink in size, but the thing that seems to always be the anchor is the location of the Chancel Arch. Um, that tends to be a fixed point. I mean, somewhere like Liminge tells us otherwise, so there are always exceptions. Uh, because what doesn't make sense is this earthwork and that church. There's, there's something weird going on there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite plausible that the former church was somewhere else if it was a timber church, and that's just my pure supposition. But where what the Anglo-Saxons, I, I don't know to the extent that that um, the insular communities did this, was they tend to have churches in, in a line. So if you're going to find another church, I would look here or here. Um, if you're on the continent, you put them in a row, um, in which case, yes, this is not a bad place to look. But I, I think this earthwork is kind of big but I think it's slightly irrelevant, even though it's so prominent. 
So I think steering our imaginings by this feature is, is going to lead us astray, potentially. But then equally, no one's actually ever dated this tower. Um, this tower, for all I know, could be 7th century. So maybe that's part of the church. Who knows? You know, mysteries here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another one is any good, what are the good best resources to find out more about early medieval ecclesiastical buildings in Sussex? Um, that is a good question. So there's lots of things which are quite sort of architecturally. Here's a church, here's another church, here's what it looked like. Um, and there's a very good book by David Parsons published by the Sussex no, by the South Downs National Park on Sussex churches, I think quite broadly, not just Anglo-Saxon. There was a book by someone called Fisher published donkeys years ago on the Saxon churches of Sussex. But again, it's kind of, I mean, D David's work is very good. Um, uh, and that's a bit more contextual in telling us sort of why churches are interesting and what they mean and what they can tell us about past societies, which is why I'm interested in them. Um, but yeah, there's there's a few things. It depends what your interest is. Um, and I'm very happy to to be emailed and to suggest stuff if there's particular churches or or lines of inquiry um, to, to, to mention things which are helpful. OK, yeah, thank you. Well, as we're coming up to eight o'clock, I'm going to hand back to Hugh. No, no. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much again, Michael. The last thing I'm going to chip in is don't just think about churches. Of course, if you've got a lovely insular monastery there, there's going to be all the exciting craft activities mm. and um, other stuff. But anyway, I'll... I'll mm. Yes. <laughs> good, good point. Potentially and metalworking. And glass making. Anyway, mm. um, anyway, that's enough. I'm going to shut up. Thank you very much, Michael, again, for a fantastic talk. Just before we sign off, I will rem uh, remind you that we have a talk uh, in a month's time on the 4th of July. And for that talk, we have uh, Ron Baxter talking about the rediscovery of Reading Abbey. So please do join us if you can. And uh, I hope to see as many of you again then. But in the meantime, thank you very much again, Michael, and thank you all for attending. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.